Welcome to the Leaders of Tomorrow show at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Today's interview is one that I'm greatly looking forward to because today we are welcoming to this show Danielle DiMartino Booth. Danielle is the CEO and Chief Strategist of Quill Intelligence and the founder of Money Strong. She is an economic expert and a regular on CNBC, Fox Business News, among others. She's also the author of the book Fed Up. And today we're going to be talking about the U.S. economies, the global economies, and we're looking forward to getting Danielle's direct style and brutal honesty. First, I want to briefly mention that in honor of Danielle's appearance on the show today, we've created a free special report for everyone to cover her background and her perspectives because this is someone that's very valuable for everyone to pay attention to and to follow as the events unfold, which are extraordinary in history across our country and throughout the world. Everyone can access the free report at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash Booth, B-O-O-T-H. Danielle, welcome to the show. How are you today? I'm great. How are you doing today? We are fantastic and we are thrilled to have you here. Now, today we're going to be talking all about money. And I want everyone to realize that Danielle brings a very unique perspective, an insider's perspective, because you spent nine years at the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. It makes it very interesting that you are the author of Fed Up. So let's start right off with your vantage point about the Federal Reserve. We hear a lot about the Fed. Talk to us about what this organization actually is, what they've done to affect the economy, and what they should be doing in the future. So we didn't used to know as much as we do today about the Fed. Had you asked somebody in 1985, Who is Paul Volcker? Somebody even in finance, they might not have had an answer for you. Uh, But in the advent of very intrusive central banking actions that that started with Alan Greenspan and grew to be bigger and bigger with with Ben Bernanke and then uh, his his successor, Janet Janet Yellen, the Fed has become part of our front and center day. Every trading day keys off of what some Fed official might or might not say, what they're alluding to, when in the beginning, they were simply, uh, they, they were brought about, J.P. Morgan had to try and put out the fires of the panic of 1907. He did so by bringing all of the biggest bankers in America into his parlor room in New York, and they figured out how to quash the fires of this massive panic that had taken over the financial markets globally. At some point, he said, you know what, I'm going to die. I'm, you know, I'm only one human being. We have to, we're, we're, we're no longer an emerging economy. The United States is a developed economy. We're going to have to do what other developed economies have done and come up with a central bank such that we don't have to hash things out in somebody's parlor room. We can actually have a financial stability authority that is, that is, Uh, accountable to Congress and that works for the country and by the way hopefully at the same time preserves the value of the US dollar and that really is what the Fed is supposed to do they're supposed to make sure that the dollar in your wallet and my wallet retains its buying power and they're supposed to make sure that the the financial system doesn't blow up and they've uh, they've definitely accomplished one but not the other Exactly. It's extraordinary. So 1907, it started just as a group of guys in a parlor room. Honestly, Danielle, it almost seems like it still has that air, you know? Well, there has been and continues to be an air of secrecy about how the Federal Reserve deliberates, how it makes monetary policy. That's one of the reasons that I I wrote Fed Up. Uh, It would be one thing if the decisions and the actions that they took were kind of ancillary to our existence, but they're not. They're front and center. So I think everybody should understand exactly how they work, even though they don't allow transcripts of their meetings to be released before five whole years have gone by. I mean, and that, that makes them, by definition, secretive. Why wouldn't, would any corporation keep under wraps for five years what had gone on during a board meeting? I think not. 
And yet that's the lag time that they have to, that we have to wait out to make them accountable. I'll give you a very good case in point. In, uh, in October 2012, an individual by the name of Jerome J. Powell had been uh, on the Federal Reserve Board for just a few months. He'd started in June of 2012. In October of that year, he said that quantitative easing could be habit forming. And he really did want to stop and think and say, you know, should we be going down this path? It looks like we're setting up more risk in the future. Well, he said that in October 2012, but it wasn't for more than five years that followed that we actually got to read that about Jay Powell as he was becoming our chairman. That is so extraordinary because you really don't know what's happening. What you know is five years in retrospect, it's got nothing. Five years is a world in the of economy course. today. Sure it I is. Mean, such a huge impact. Let's turn specifically, Danielle, to the USD, the United mm-hmm. States dollar. On one hand, the USD seems to be used as a weapon right now for sanctions and trade negotiations, and it's at an all-time high versus other currencies. On the other hand, there is a repurchase operation taking place right now in the background. And I want us to go into this for everyone that doesn't realize what this is. Describe what's happening. Well, so the Federal Reserve, in in its wisdom, launched quantitative easing. At the same time, there were other regulatory entities that were global and here within the United States that were penalizing big banks for holding certain types of securities on their balance sheets to be used as collateral for overnight lending. So in in the aftermath of the world of Dodd-Frank and what's called Basel III, which came out of international regulatory authorities, banks were penalized basically for holding anything but the most pristine collateral of treasuries on their balance sheet. This has greatly restricted banks' ability to step in in the overnight lending market we are finding out in the aftermath of the Fed's failed attempt to roll back quantitative easing. It was called quantitative tightening. This was the Fed trying to roll securities back off of its balance sheet that had grown to be $4.5 trillion. They had to stop at $3.8 trillion. And that's where the Fed's balance sheet is as we speak, as they get ready to put $60 billion per month back on their balance sheet again in order to resolve a crisis that was brought about by the right hand not knowing what the left hand was doing in terms of two regulatory entities in the United States and abroad. In addition to the fact that that banks were quote unquote hoarding their collateral, holding tight to their treasury securities, worldwide as, as confidence has gone down in other central banks who have taken their interest rates into negative territory, we've seen cash in circulation increase. That's just a pure reflection of people having a little bit less confidence and saying, you know what, I'm gonna put my dollar bills, my hundred dollar bills under the mattress. I'm gonna hide them. So that takes even more collateral out of the system. So you had quantitative tightening to the tune of some $700 billion. You have cash in circulation going up. You have foreign central banks parking money at the Federal Reserve because they get a higher interest rate by doing so. That sucks even more cash out of the system. And lo and behold, you have a liquidity crisis crop up overnight on September the 16th. And the Fed has to come racing to the rescue in what's called the repurchase market. That's an overnight lending market. Don't think of it as anything other than banks lending to banks overnight just for everyday operating needs. But all of a sudden, there was this big vacuum sound, and there was too little of it to go around. So the Fed had to step in with emergency operations in the repo market. And as we now know, they're going to be expanding the balance sheet and putting more liquidity into the system by buying up to one-year maturity treasury bills for the next eight months in what they're calling an overnight operation, but certainly not QE, but in the real world is indeed more QE. They're growing their balance sheet, they're monetizing the US debt. And yet, as you say, we have this deep dichotomy because we have the US dollar as strong as it is. Wow, that is really tough to wrap your head around because- It's awful, it's awful stuff. (laughs) I mean, it's, (laughs) <laughs> it's almost there's almost no linguistics 
for how bad this is? It is, it's, A, it's extremely complex. And, and I, I always take issue with the Fed kind of wrapping their arms around the complexity because it tends to push out the, the, just your regular investor. It pushes out institutional investors. You, you can have a several long hour discussion on this. I've written 8,000 words on this subject. It's extremely complex. Uh, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try and at least grasp what's happening. And that is the Federal Reserve took interest rates to the zero bound during the financial crisis years. That was not enough easing to propel the economy to what, remember the term escape velocity? That wasn't enough to get the economy into an escape velocity mode. So they started printing money and growing the balance sheet, promising us Ben Bernanke made a commitment that we would re-shrink that balance sheet just as soon as we were able to normalize monetary policy. An attempt at that was enough to bring the financial system to its knees and trigger a liquidity crisis that we're dealing with today. Right. Um, I want to go into this notion of negative interest rates. Ooh, do we have to? <laughs> <laughs> right. It's so important for everyone, not just to understand the um, complexity of the repurchasing that's happening overnight, which is it's, it's exploding. I'm stuttering. It's exploding our debt. It's exploding it to the point where people don't even understand the, the tip we're, we're standing on the tiny tip, <laughs> yep. uh, right? Uh, you know, one little, one little breeze. And uh, I've talked to many people that say, you know, we don't know what that breeze, you know, because most people think that it's a controlled effort, that, you know, there's some sort of controlling hand out there that knows what it's doing, even though it's doing this. And that's not true. There's no control because they cannot predict if some investor is going to, you know, a multi-billion dollar investor is going to come in and, and sell one day, you know, that they don't know about and boom, there it is, right? So speak on not just um, the negative interest rates, but what's the impact of the um, unpredictability of what's happening? So I think you have to step back and look at what was supposed to be an era of deleveraging. In that era of deleveraging, we've seen global debt go from about 200 trillion to about 250 trillion. So not too much in the way of deleveraging. But throughout the current recovery and expansion, we have not seen households putting debt onto their balance sheets, but rather U.S. corporations. Corporate America has bulked up on debt. We now have about $10 trillion of, of corporate debt the way we think of it as being in the high yield bond market, leveraged loans, the investment grade bond market. In sum total, non-financial corporations have $15.5 trillion of debt, 74% of US GDP, an all time record. That's where we've seen this massive debt buildup in the current expansion. When you see debt get to be this big and go into corners of the market where it doesn't belong, financing entities that shouldn't be accessing leverage, something can go wrong. The more debt you have, the higher the probability and the greater the risk that you're going to have a hiccup, that you're going to have, as you say, somebody come out and start to panic and sell down. And the credit event is really what precludes the Fed from being able to address what could potentially come. It was the same exact same thing with the subprime crisis. It was just a different type of debt. It was household debt. But now we have corporate debt. We have debt in China that's another black box of its own. And I don't think authorities can say with any assurance that if there was to be a credit event, given what they've done in response to overnight liquidity issues, we're already 60, 60, people forget that when quantitative easing was at its biggest, it was 85 billion a month. We've come out of the gate at 60 for an overnight liquidity issue, for heaven's sake. So I think people have to understand that to, to your breeze analogy, when you've got this much debt going to entities that don't deserve it, that they're not credit worthy, that any little thing could upset the calm that we see in the markets today. So it's a little bit deceptive yes. at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be 
speaking minimally. <laughs> Let's turn now to politics, Danielle and President Trump. Mm -hmm. um, I want to get your perspective on his Twitter account. Um, how much impact you think he has when he tweets, especially in the direction of the Federal Reserve, because it does seem like they respond in ways that almost challenge him. I know that he is a big proponent of dropping interest rates, which um, they can't go much further before we're into the negative territory. So um, first of all, what's your perspective on the president's impact? So I think that, uh, look, J.P. Morgan has come up with an index that tracks th th the efficacy of Trump tweets. I mean, it's actually become its own financial instrument. Crazy but true. Uh, but as, as somebody who follows the markets very closely, I will say that I think that, that Trump's greatest impact on the markets via his Twitter account are when it comes to the trade war. I think that they pay less attention because you brought up a very good point. It's almost as if sometimes you look at Fed actions and, and it looks like policymakers are trying to make policy in defiance of what Trump wants. And right now, I would actually applaud that because he's tweeted out in the past, Europe has negative interest rates. Why shouldn't we? And I oh, say, oh, no, 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 no. Somebody turned the Twitter account off. Please. <laughs> I don't want to go into negative interest rate territory. Um, but I would prefer that his criticism of the Fed was more more genteel, less abusive, uh, because we have to understand that we have to have confidence in our institutions. We're not a third world country, you know, sometimes you see on TV, you know, that the, some East Asian parliament has broken out in a fist fight and you see people flying across rooms and you're like, that doesn't look like government to me. That's right. We don't want to go there as a country. Uh, we're dignified. I think our founding fathers are spinning in their graves. Um, but on the other hand, you know, he has definitely, President Trump has definitely found a way of communicating directly to his contingency in the face of, I think, a lot of relevant and justified criticism of a media that refuses to tell both sides of the story, regardless of which media outlet you're referring to. Right, right. Um, I'm a conservative, so um, I'm not a Republican. I'm a constitutionalist, uh, but I am Man. a conservative. And um, so a lot of what the president does, I'm, I'm very much for. However, um, there are things that, I mean, I've never met anyone that I agree with everything they say, so <laughs> I'll just say that's that. <laughs> Ever. That's, that's, a, that's a good gut check for yourself. <laughs> but when he goes into these negative interest rates, Danielle, um, this is very concerning to me. I've, um, we've spoken with several. We've brought to our audience um, Gerald Salente and Jim Rogers and a couple of other people that discuss the fact that many other portions of the world are going cashless. Mm -hmm. So when it's all digital and it's cashless and the banks are in complete control of your money and now there's negative interest rates. Goosebumps. Hmm. You just gave me goosebumps and not in a good way. Right? Speak to this. <laughs> so, uh, it's, you know, this is a very thorny issue because once you have sovereigns that are digitized, uh, governments can say what they want. They can completely monitor every penny you spend once everything, once paper cash has been outlawed. And I think that we should look at the countries that have been at the forefront of introducing sovereign cryptocurrencies, Venezuela, Russia, China, and understand that it is their government's modus operandi to monitor what their citizens purchase. But that is so antithetical to what the American idea of liberty is that, as I said, it just gave me goosebumps listening to you describe what the future could be. You know, to, to Jay Powell's credit, uh, he's actually been very forthright in saying, you know, that's not the direction that we should be headed in. Theoretically, Fed coin, they call it, Fed coin. And that would replace the, the sovereign note in, in, in our wallet. I, I really hope we don't go there. I think that there'll have to be a compromise for national security purposes, unfortunately. If China has a massive sovereign 
crypto presence, I think that we'll have to at least have an understanding or have an alternative of a digital currency, again, for national security. Look at what they look at what China's done to our intellectual property, for heaven's sake. Can you imagine if they were the only people inside the crypto space, what they could potentially do and the damage they could do to our financial system? I don't even want to think about that. But I think that there should always be optionality because that defines what being American is, is being able to make a choice and not being forced to do something by your government. So I'm, I'm look, I, I have a, a, a fairly loud public voice and I will continue battling and campaigning against going down this rabbit hole because there's nothing that, that to me uh, strips you of your liberty quicker than, than, not being, than not having the ability to choose how and through what instrument you spend your hard-earned money. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was actually frightened when I was speaking with um, Jim Rogers because he's very forthright. He's um, an excellent um, predictor of what's going to happen, you know, um, as by his historic record. Sure. And um, he is predicting that the cashless society isn't just coming, but is imminent to the United States. So people, um, not only do they need to understand what's happening in the, um, these buybacks that are, I know it's complex, but everyone, it affects us. It affects us and it could affect us as soon as two to three years from now. Um, it's, it's not that far down the road. Is that your perspective also? What do you see? I don't think that we'll be cashless that quickly, but I will say that there is something that is deeply unsettling about the simple demographic reality of there being more millennials than there are baby boomers in short order in this year. This is the year that the, the, the number of baby boomers in this country is overtaken by the number of millennials. And I worry that a lot of millennials couldn't, couldn't define socialism or capitalism but have shown themselves to be very much followers. And I worry that if all of these socialist programs are somehow enacted, that the only way to deploy them is going to be digitally, such that we end up on a slippery slope into some kind of a cryptocurrency so that we can you know, effectively and efficiently deliver universal basic income to everybody who wants it. And that, I just gave myself goosebumps because that makes me also just, ugh. Right. But I do worry that, that there, are, there's, there are going to be too many young people who advocate for this because they see this as being more just kind of the way technology is moving and all you old geezers need to figure it out and get with it. They don't see the crux of the argument as being one of, you're an American, you should at all costs safeguard your liberty. I don't think that they see it that way. And that frightens me because there's whatever, 82, 3 million of them. You know, the impact that they have, the power that they have in terms of numbers is, um, I mean, it trumps everything. It really does. When you have a huge mass amount of people um, voting in a certain way, um, who don't realize, and I think um, to, to some extent, um, it's not their fault. It's they're reacting to things they see and things they've been taught. Right. And, you know, the, the think about it. they were all told, look, when I was in high school, there was still shop. My mother would say, you better not go out with those boys who are in shop. But there was still shop. There was still vocational training in this country, and there was no stigma about it. We're talking about an entire generation that was pushed into a four-year college degree, whether or not it's worth the paper it's printed on or not. Now they're overloaded with student debt, their job opportunities are limited, and they're looking for a way out. And what's, what makes this entire situation, I try and explain this to people, what makes the situation much worse, and this is, I'm speaking as a parent now, is when you have your own children, you naturally, something inside of you is born that wants for them to achieve things that are greater than you have. I think if more millennials had children, that they would have this innate sense of, I want my children to succeed more than I have. But not enough of them have procreated. Not enough of them have settled down and, and, and set up house and home and had children so that they can have those natural instincts take over that would thereby say, you know what, wait a minute, universal basic income is, isn't 
good for me. How am I going to tell my child to achieve more than that? So I think that the work ethic has not been universally embraced by this generation. And as you say, it really is not all their fault. But I look to the conservatives in the country to do a better job of financial literacy, of educating on the perils of some of the things that are being suggested that sound like they're so easy that would take our country down the wrong path. You're exactly right. You're exactly right. I think conservatives, they're, they're sort of passive in a way. And it's, it's you know, they're, they're seen as the power structure and the man, you know, and the, the liberals are the resistance. And that's not true. Republicans and, and conservatives at large are actually very open to everyone, believe, because they're, they're so strong in the Constitution, because that's the way they believe our country should be run. Right. They believe in the First Amendment. And that's what's happening, is that conservatives so strongly believe in everybody's right to free speech and everyone's right to defend themselves against somebody breaking in or the government, the Second Amendment, everyone of the conservative side believes that so strongly that they sit back and they allow this rhetoric mm -hmm. and they don't stop it with the ferocity that the rhetoric's coming at them. Well said. Well said. Look, if, if you think about what, what the millennials are fighting for at their core, it's the same thing conservatives are. Look, they're saying that everybody in the country should have an opportunity. And I step back and say, well, you know what? Have the teachers unions not been able to completely sabotage the public education system in this country? Then maybe we wouldn't be where we are today. Maybe there would be a pathway forward for everybody. And by the way, that is something that is embraced ironically and universally by millennials and, and the people who they perceive as being their en enemies alike. Exactly. And it's the great ironic um, result here that these people in college that are racking up huge debt to go to college, that have all of these dreams about what's going to their future and what they're going to build and the companies they're going to found and the way they're going to pay their parents back and buy their homes and, you know, take it. That's capitalism. Oh, it is. It certainly is. They don't understand. Yeah. Their dreams are capitalism. They are. I just wish that they wanted to pay their student loans back more than they do. <laughs> I'll never forget the day I paid mine back. It was like, oh my gosh, free at last, seriously. And I, 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 I get worried about, bizarrely enough, the politicians who are well into their 70s who are trying to sell a bill of rights to this young generation. But I do, I, I, look, I have hope, and I think that financial literacy is something that can be accomplished. You look at the generations that are behind the millennials, they're much more conservative in their leanings, and, uh, you know, maybe between the two generations, we can, we can do a better job of coming together and communicating as one. You know, that's a, that's a great point. That's a great point. The generations coming up behind the millennials are huge conservatives and very uh, Christian and very tight. Like, I mean, they're very, you know, you look at these, these people, the, the younger um, ones, ones in high school and stuff like that, they're looking at the people that are older than them saying, you're crazy, you know, um, and they're extremely literate. They're very um, capable verbally. You know, I've listened to a lot of uh, debates from people in high school that debate on the side of capitalism. They're extraordinary. So you, you're right. That's a really good point. It's just that there's a certain generation, this generation of millennials. What do you think happened? Well, I think in a way, I mean, you know, when, when I was 13 years old, I was told that if I wanted spending money and if I wanted to go to the mall, I needed to go babysit. And, you know, there's something to be said for the fact that as, as parents, you have an obligation to instill a work ethic in your children, not give them everything they want. And, uh, you know, this is, this, is, this is a generation that more than any other, their parents have continued into adulthood to help support them. Now, some of this obviously has to do with mom and dad saying, you must get this four-year degree. And by the way, if, you, if, if liberal arts is going to make you happy, by the way, it's not going to make you money, but if it's going to make you happy, go right ahead and go into debt to do it. To me, they're, 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 we have to look back to the millennials' parents in a way because they, sell their, they sold their own children a, a bad bill of goods and they should have painted a more 
realistic picture. And by the way, this is the same generation that it was the first to embrace debt wholesale and credit card spending and living beyond their means. Remember yuppies? Well, these are the parents of the millennials. And I think that the onus goes back on them to have explained more about what the real world was going to be rather than just make their path cushy and, 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 and say, here, here's your glide path to college. Go have a great life. And by the way, why are you still living in my house 10 years later? So, <laughs> right. It, I mean, it, it's not, we, we can't crucify the millennials. I just, I, I don't, I don't buy into that, but I think that financial literacy is sorely lacking. Right. Right. I, I think when you give someone everything they want and then, and then you say, okay, now do it yourself. It's like, how, how, I don't know how. And, and everybody else has better stuff than me. And look at these older people that have more things and they need to give them all to me. And it's just like, you're standing back and looking and saying, you've been to college, you've, you know, you're out on your own and you don't know anything really. You know, it's just, it's sort of, um, it's a great wrong that has been done to them. Oh, it is. And, you know, and look, let's bring the Federal Reserve back into the discussion. You know, part of my time on the inside, I was arguing that if they kept interest rates at artificially repressed levels for too long, that they were going to invite the wrong type of characters into the housing market, that they were not going to expunge the investor class out of housing, which should have happened in the aftermath of the, the, the bursting of the biggest housing bubble since the Great Depression. It didn't happen. The Fed kept interest rates so low that private equity investors came swarming into a lot of these markets and bought the foreclosed homes that the millennials should have been buying at fire sale prices. But there they are financed with zero interest rate policy. They come in and now millennials see that not only is buying a home the most expensive proposition, but renting a, an apartment is also more expensive than it's been in U.S. history because... Again, in a zero rate environment, if you're Joe Q apartment developer, the only thing that makes the math work if you're doing your internal rate of return calculation is if you build luxury units. It's the only thing that's gonna pay off in the end according to what your spreadsheet's telling you. So now we have an overabundance of overpriced homes, luxury homes that have been built and great big skyscrapers full of luxury apartment units, none of which millennials who are getting started in their careers should be able to afford. That's not what I had to do when I was in, in graduate school. I didn't have to shoulder that kind of really expensive rent. And yet, the Federal Reserve being overly intrusive, which, by the way, is un-American, has now made housing out of reach as well. And the kids are effectively paying their student loans, which should be their down payment money. So it's just a mess. It really is. And you just hit on a really good point. They missed a huge opportunity, one of the best in probably modern history, sure. to make money. They really did. They were in the plum seat coming out of college, man, to swoop in and, and pick up all of those foreclosures and, and really, really dive in and, and build a build empire for themselves. This generation had the opportunity to build an, an empire yep. and they missed it because oh, it was it was also ripped out of their hands. Right. Because they couldn't compete with people with playing with other people's cash. And that's what Federal Reserve policy has done. It has truly enriched Wall Street at the expense of Main Street. And I absolutely detest that cliche. I really do. But if you look at the income disparity in this country, which is also very un-American, I mean, we should all be able to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and live the American dream. Any of us, no matter where we're born into, this is not India. We don't have a caste system. But if you look at Fed policy, it really has taken a situation that was created by the degradation of public education in America, K through 12, and built upon that by giving all of the riches of 30 years of Greenspan policy of constantly bailing out Wall Street and making sure that all of the riches just go to this particular small set of people that now the socialist politicians are saying, look at the bad guys, look at the billionaires. Again, now, I'm myopic. I spent nine years inside the Fed, but a lot of this is a direct cause of Fed policy. It's fascinating. I want to shift now to gold. Mm. Um, I'd like to get your perspective on the role of gold coming up in the global economy. 
Well, you know, it's interesting. I think gold is, uh, I don't think we have a practicable way to go back onto a gold standard. That being said, you don't see news that other countries are building up their gold stores for no reason at all. And I think that it is something that sovereign countries have on hand uh, in order to make sure that they're prepared in the event of something really bad going wrong. Gee, let me think of who's been building up their gold stores the quickest. That would be China. Uh, but from, a, from an investor's perspective, from an investor's perspective, I think that having a prudent allocation to gold is the one foolproof way of making sure that no matter what happens in the financial markets, that you are properly hedged because it is the only 100% uncorrelated assets, asset to every other risky asset out there. So in terms of the gold standard, I want to go back to that. Um, mm -hmm. You don't see that coming in the near future. There's a lot of talk of it. There is, and there, there will always be talk of, of, of gold. And I think that the talk of gold, there just, there, there really isn't enough of it, but there was no discipline that was put in its place when the world got off the gold standard. And I think that people talk about a return to the gold standard because there's this desperation to get back to sound money policies where you don't have a federal reserve with a 2% inflation target that is formal and stated, meaning that in 50 years time, the dollar bill in your wallet is going to be worth approximately nothing. So I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a gold bug. I'm not a proponent of going back on the gold standard, but I'm extremely sympathetic to where they're coming from because it is, it, it is, it, it's saying to the Fed, it's saying to other central banks, you're wrong in having a 2% inflation target. The best inflation that you could possibly strive for is zero to where I retain 100% of every dollar that I earn and not have it be formally and, and purposely degraded 2% per year as a goal. It's crazy. Right. Where do you see this headed? And what do you see the solution mm. as being? You know, it's interesting. You, you're, you're asking me some questions that other people don't. And I don't even normally talk about politics. And we've really gone down that road. Um, but uh, I, I'm... I see right now as the Fed trying to do something that they've never done. And I think people need to have a better appreciation for the fact that Jay Powell has a background in banking. He is trying to spearhead getting out in front of a potential crisis. Now, there are a lot of moving pieces and there are a lot of things that can go wrong. But we will, we'll, we'll know soon enough is he, if he's going to be able to succeed in threading the needle and bringing the U.S. economy to a soft landing. But I think everything has to go so right for this best case scenario to play out as being planned right now that we have to understand that with the buildup in debt that we've had and with the animosity within our country, and with other countries right now, that there is the potential for another financial crisis and there is the potential for the currency war that is ongoing to lead to a different type of conflict. And those are just realities that we should, we should understand and accept because you're either fooled after the fact or you're prepared beforehand. Right. I really like that your perspective on Jay Powell is positive. It's very unusual. Well, I, well, I never yeah. said it's positive. Oh, 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 okay. All right. This, Correct. this is a man who has embraced quarantine. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm no fan of blowing up the balance sheet. Um, and I never was. I was... I think that quantit I think that the first round of quantitative easing was re was kind of necessary because there were great big huge flames in the global financial system that were threatening to take the financial system down. Now it was a creation of the Fed's own doing. They created the housing bubble, as Jim Grant famously says, they were both arsonist and firefighter. So I give no sympathy to the Fed for having to launch QE, the first iteration of QE in the first place, but it needed to be done at the time because we were all going to melt off the planet. And inevitably, if the banking system goes down, it hurts little people that much more. I was vehemently opposed to QE2, vehemently opposed to QE3, as was Jay Powell, by the way. And I have zero appreciation for him re-embracing 
quantitative easing and blowing up the Fed's balance sheet because it's a slippery slope and it puts us in a vulnerable position as a country to go there. And by the way, it's something that he used to be in direct opposition of, which we found out after the fact. So all I'm saying is he has a better grasp of the intersection of the financial markets and the economy than his predecessors who were pure academics. And because he understands the interplay between the financial markets and between the economy, and he can see where we're headed, he's trying to be more preemptive than his predecessors and prevent the financial markets from melting down. I don't know that he's going to succeed. I'm just saying he's one cool cat and he can connect the dots better than Janet Yellen, who as president of the San Francisco Federal Reserve had the biggest subprime banking uh, bubble blow up in her backyard. Countrywide, New Century, IndyMac, Wells Fargo, all of these massive subprime lenders were under her watch. And because she was a labor economist and only understood the academic economic data side of the, of the equation, she didn't have a clear understanding of how the financial markets were playing fire with what was going on in the economy. I'm just saying Jay Powell could connect the dots better than she did, better than Ben Bernanke did, better than Alan Greenspan did. We'll see if he succeeds or not, but I'm no fan of blowing up the country's balance sheet, the Fed's balance sheet, no fan. Right, right. So even though you don't have a complete comfort with what he's doing right now, his overall perspective is coming from more of a, um, uh, an educational um, and experienced situation than many people right. prior to him. Um, what would you do if you were him? Gosh, that's, I mean, I, I think he's in between a rock and a hard place in the fourth quarter of 2018. He saw what it looked like. Uh, General Electric's bonds were downgraded to, uh, and they, they traded overnight to junk bond territory. Within 14 days of the General Electric Halloween downgrade, the entire junk bond market in the United States shut down for a record 41 days. There were no bonds issued. And uh, the credit event that I was describing earlier started to unfold. And pensions, public pensions, suffered their worst quarter in decades, and it was just a complete and total mess. And Jay Powell had to come riding into the rescue with the famous Powell pivot in early January and say, you know what, quantitative easing might be in the cards. And that reopened the junk bond market. And I understand why he did what he did, but I was not happy about it at the time because I was known as founding the Jay Powell fan club. And that didn't work out so well for me in the end when he said on stage with Ben Bernanke, with Janet Yellen, he apologized for his younger, when, when I was just on the committee and I was being disparaging of QE, I apologize. And when he did that, I mean, I had, I had virtual Kleenexes coming at me from all over the country. Hmm. So it's really hard to say what Jay Powell should be doing, but he should not become an instrument of any political faction. He should stop lowering the federal funds rate when it hits 1%. He shouldn't go back to the zero bound and invite even the debate about negative interest rates to enter the discussion. And I think that he should, he should back away from doing quantitative easing, even if it means the economy goes into recession. Because if you push this out too far, we're going to have a much more dramatic downturn and a much deeper crisis that takes that much longer to recover from. And I worry that if we continue going through these boom and bust cycles, that at some point another country is going to sense that we're so vulnerable that they can move in. There it is. That's the answer to my next question. What if this goes wrong? That's, that's again, currency wars in the past. If you look back to Portugal, if you look back to the Spanish Empire, if you look back to Great Britain, if you look back to other countries that have lost their reserve currency status, it has happened in a time of war that was preceded by a buildup of debt that was more than the country could afford in the ultimate, in the end, that made them thereby vulnerable. And that is how reserve currency status is lost, or at least how it's been lost historically. Not in a currency war, but in a hot war. 
And that is what I worry about for my children's sake, but they're going to have children one day. I don't, I, I kind of like the idea of the world revolving around the U.S. dollar. It's nice to be the biggest guy, you know, out there, biggest gal out there, whatever you want to call it. They say God is a woman and I'm buying it. But, <laughs> um, but I, it, it, but we, the more debt we print, the more vulnerable we render the country, its sovereignty, its supremacy to being taken over by another entity, whether it be China or another country. But right now, it looks like the Chinese have a much longer term vision on, on finding that economic supremacy. 15 years ago, you couldn't have convinced most people that 10 years on, China would have the second largest economy in the world, and yet it does. So I just, you know, that maybe their first aircraft carrier was, was constructed of Legos, fine, but they improved upon it with the second one. And they really are building islands out in the middle of the South China Sea. And nobody, no international authority has slowed them down or stopped them. So, you know, it's, you can ignore these things at your peril, or you can be prepared. Right. And I think that's the bottom line issue for everybody to understand, because many people are like, well, um, so what if they keep printing money? I mean, it's not, there's no problem with that. So what if they keep printing, printing, printing? And um, we're trying to get across the perspective that it puts us in a situation of peril. And you just nutshelled it exactly. The peril is another country coming in because we're so vulnerable economically and um, not, not a good situation for the United States. I think every high school student should be, uh, I think it should be on every high school in America's curriculum, the simple study of how reserve currencies have been lost throughout history, starting with the Romans. And if you have a simple understanding of that history and how they're lost, then it gives you immediate, instantaneous perspective on why we can't run up debt forever. Exactly. Danielle, this has been a fascinating interview. Please tell everyone where they can go to follow your work. Uh, so please come to my website, quillintelligence.com. We'll actually be providing uh, a, a sample for you of the Daily Feather. Uh, and you know what? If you're bored, if you're an insomniac, I don't sleep very much either myself, but certainly follow me on Twitter. Um, it, is, it is never scripted. It is unhinged, and it is always educational. Uh, I'm on a mission. I, I, I call it the research revolution, and I think financial literacy should be top and center for our country. So follow me at Demartino Booth as well. Fantastic mission. Thank you so much for coming on this show today. Thank you. Appreciate your time. Danielle DiMartino Booth, economic expert, CEO of Quill Intelligence, and whose work is covered in our free exclusive report at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com slash booth. For the leaders of tomorrow's show, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com.